So, good afternoon. I'll officially call to order the study session of the Coachella Valley Water District Board of Directors, March 21, 2023, here in Palm Desert. You wouldn't know it by all the rain, uh, but um, pretty nice out there. Would you please uh, stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's see if he answers the roll call. No, I know. Well, I'm just saying he could always just come in the last second here. Uh, roll call, please. Good afternoon, President Pell. Here. Vice President Estrada. Here. Director Bianco. Here. Director Aguilar. Here. And Director Nelson. Uh, if he joins us, I will note for the record the time that he joined. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone wishing to make public comment at this time? And I do not show any attendees online, Mr. President. Okay. Don't see a whole lot of members of the public out there. Oh, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, so we have three items of study for today. As shown on the agenda, um, th this is a study session, so we will not be taking action today, uh, but uh, we will proceed through um, the, the three items. First one is the discussion of district debt uh, presented by our Director of Finance, Rick Aragon. Uh, go ahead, Rick. All right. Well, good afternoon, President Powell and members of the board. Uh, this item, uh, staff wanted to bring to you because uh, we've been fortunate over the last several years to have a number of uh, different funding opportunities, usually through state and federal programs that we've taken advantage of. Um, but it's been a number of different debt items, both bonds and, and these. And so thought it was a good time before we talk about the CIP to, to see one as a goal, where are we now comprehensively as a district rather than individual programs? And then two, uh, namely, where do we need to go over the next five years to fund the CIP that we're gonna be talking about in the next item. And so, uh, just up front, some, some key takeaways, because as we get into numbers, it can, uh, we can get into different rabbit trails of, of ideas and questions. And so just up front, one wanted to say that uh, the district has gone under, undergone pretty, pretty significant change recently, and we're talking since uh, fiscal year uh, 2019, where at that point, we were uh, what we would call 100% pay-go, or cash funding projects, with the one exception that we did take advantage of um, interfund borrowing and loaning projects. So we're loaning ourselves money, uh, but no external debt. And so to go from that to debt being a primary funding mechanism for a number of our CIP projects and even looking forward, which is a key part of this discussion, uh, where it's gonna be necessary to fund uh, CIP, CIP projects going forward. So a big change in how we do business. Not only have we picked up debt as a primary funding mechanism, but uh, unlike some districts, we don't or haven't primarily used just bonds, as I've been talking about. We've, we've uh, actually primarily taken advantage of different programs to issue debt, which means that we have uh, different strings attached to, to each source of money that we've been borrowing from. Uh, and there's a number of different programs that we've been borrowing from, as we'll get into in the program. So we have a diverse portfolio of debt. Uh, as I, I mentioned up front, uh, we do, at least we, we believe and recommend, we should be issuing uh, more debt to fund the CIP going forward. Um, it's uh, selective funds, we'll get into the details of that, but it's about 100 million, 99 uh, specifically, over the entire five year CIP, we're not talking about an individual year. Um, and so uh, the 100 million will get us to the end of the CIP for each of the funds, uh, and really that's primarily to help keep rate increases manageable um, otherwise, we would either draw our reserves down to, to very low levels, which triggers other issues, um, or have to radically raise rates to try and fund them within a few years on a PAYGO CIP basis, which um, just, just doesn't seem appropriate. And so 
Uh, with all of that, as you can imagine, which this is my job to try and um, administer and manage the compliance of all of this and, and uh, make sure that we get the most attractive interest rates possible. So uh, all of that leading to the bottom line, which is uh, we're really managing around uh, two key things, and you'll hear this again and again, both in this presentation and the one in the end. Uh, a lot of this relates to reserve levels, which is how much cash on hand or investments on hand we have as a security blanket for the unknown. Uh, and then debt coverage, which is all about how much net revenue we have left over paying our expenses to cover our mortgage, so to speak, on, on the CIP. And that ultimately means how much in rate increases we need to, to get to these levels. And so uh, that being said. Just real quick, does the 99 million include the, the 2 million that we discussed at the end? No, this is on top. So, which, which is part of the reason for the presentation is it can be confusing on which, which debt we're talking about. And so this first slide uh, is, is to say, um, as I mentioned before, since 2019, this graph would have been zero across the funds with the exception of the interfund loans. Um, but now, in terms of actual outstanding debt owed, um, we're at 226 million, and that includes the interfund loan um, of about 51 million. But we have several programs outstanding. Uh, Director Bianchi mentioned one, which is the Canal one with the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, but that plus USDA loans that are active and SRF loans that are active, we just haven't done the projects yet to draw down on those loans. So once we do, within this five years, uh, we're jumping from 226 million uh, to 368 million or another $142 million. And that's with what we consider existing authorized debt. The board's already approved this, and the grantors have already approved that, with the exception of one SRF loan in sanitation, which is, I think, really more of an administrative matter than a substance matter. They're, they're going to approve it. We just haven't got technically there yet. Um, and the last note I wanted to bring on this one, and it's just to highlight up front as we talk about domestic, which, of course, is a key, key fund um, with our broad customer base of, of water customers is that uh, the, the debt is necessary largely because, uh, as we stand now, there's no leftover money in any material sense um, once we pay operating expenses to fund any replacement capital. So either we uh, build up um, a sort of net revenue to cover ongoing PAYGO CIP, or we have to issue debt, which is what we're talking about. So taking that same Rick, graph. I'm sorry, can you go back? Yes. So I have a similar question. So does the, the 368 million include both the 99 million of additional debt and then the 21 million of the board approved but not yet awarded? It doesn't include the 99, so you would take the 368 plus 99, but it includes everything else that's and, already and been the, And the 21 million uh, board approved but not yet granted, that's in the 368? That's in the 368. Okay, thank you. Yes. And so uh, taking the same uh, graph to say, well, what is the state debt made of? Mostly to point out the fact that each fund is different and has a different sort of portfolio of debt, which really means each fund has different restrictions associated to it. This isn't a district-wide approach. Each fund has to be managed uh, independently. So for instance, the Canal Fund, all of its debt is relating to the Bureau loan, which we've talked about. And you'll notice of, of the to in total, we have 58 million there. It's a little bit less than the headline $60 million number that we've shown because we, we think in our CIP it'll come in a little bit under the unactual expenses, even though we're authorized for a little bit more. Um, on the domestic, we actually have a breakdown between a uh, loan with the state through the SRF program and then uh, the federal loan through the USDA, which we haven't drawn down on money yet. Uh, East replenishment is all bonded debt. Uh, sanitation has no bonded debt uh, currently, but that's in the, the, the five-year plan with the 99 million. Um, and so we're strictly dealing with SRF restrictions. Stormwater has both. It, it's half federal funding through WIFIA and half bond. And then West replenishment uh, is all uh, just internal funds. So it's whatever restrictions the board places um, on the, the debt structure. Uh, all right, so the 50 million is part of the 368. Yes, it's, it's, it's already in there. Give me a minute. Yeah, got it. And just for those that love details, I included this slide as a reference page for what makes up the 368 million. If there was any question, you can look per fund. The, the big takeaway here, and this, this is a big source of accomplishment, is for 368 million, once you average the average interest rate, most of these being these special programs that we've been pursuing, 
uh, we have an average of a 2.2% interest rate, um, which is phenomenal uh, for a funding CIP. It's a third of, of inflation right now. You know, that, it's just an interesting thing because I always think of bonded debt as pretty inefficient and expensive, even though our bond, I mean, even the bond numbers aren't that high. You know, historically, 3.85 is the highest one, and it's not, you know, that mm. doesn't sound like such a horrible number, but compared to what we've been able to borrow on these loans, I mean, it, those rates are really great. I mean, right? I mean, in anyone's lifetime, who did we think we would see right. those kind of rates? So the timing was good, I guess. That was my only point. Yes, and as we, we learned uh, with some of the Bureau loans, the matter of a month could have made a huge difference. And so taking advantage of timing. Good timing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so on, on that note, um, I wanted to show as, as a general breakdown where we're getting our existing debt from. And sure. Director Bianco, your mic. Thank you. Just so I understand it, maybe the other board members are thinking the same thing. So as we go through these, Mid Valley Pipeline, that's all been approved? So yes, yeah, so that, that was a loan already done uh, from the domestic fund to the uh, West Replenishment Fund to pay for the Mid Valley Pipeline. So that's, that's already been done. Was it done a long repaid. time ago? Yes, so years that was ago. Done a long time ago. Long time ago. That was, okay, that was the original. Doesn't die. Right. Okay, okay, okay. And so, and just a few of them that, so all of these are all approved and either in the works or completed? Yes. Okay. So going back to that Interfund loan, it's the only one with no terms. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've... <laughs> if you read ahead, you're going to see... I, you'll, you'll see a proposal, proposal from me. Okay. The proposal, which I was really happy to see, by the way. And the first yeah. proposal in... Ever. Ever. So yeah. thank you. There was, there was an original. <laughs> to, not, to just wipe it out. <laughs> oh, issue bonds, yeah. So on, on this slide, it was mostly just to point out, and, and I would consider this a source of envy for other water districts, that of, of this existing debt portfolio of projects that have already been authorized and that we funded, it's 60% funded with state and federal loans, which is a huge number. I mean, most districts would be happy with something like 10 or 15%. Um, obviously, we, we have uh, advantages with our connection with the Bureau and other federal programs on, on things like the canal system, but overall, I mean, over 220 million in the federal and state uh, uh, programs. And so 26% uh, uh, being bonds uh, on, on existing bonds, um, but still a significant portion being that interfund loan, we were just talking about it, a little over 50 million. And so just as, as the highlight, which um, most of this is pretty common sense, but uh, state and federal loans, of course, as we were just looking at, have the lowest interest rates. That's why we, we pursue them and uh, almost always they're worth it because the interest rate or principal forgiveness is, is another element, especially in things like SRF loans or other money that they attach on grants uh, make them very attractive. Uh, but they often are the most stringent on, on conditions and there's a lot of different whether that's uh, requirements for like uh, American Iron and Steel or that's uh, certain debt covenants, uh, we've dealt with that on the SRF side, or even the USDA loan has a requirement, as I understand it, that we have to approve our budgets now once the, once the loan is effective, which is now um, 30 days in advance of June 30th. I mean, you get all sorts of oddball requirements that we have to manage. The one exception, just to note, the, the Bureau loan uh, that, that we got for the uh, irrigation laterals and uh, uh, mid-canal storage uh, has probably the least restrictions out of all of them. Um, it doesn't even have a debt coverage requirement specifically. And so uh, it's the one exception I wanted to give them credit. Um, they're very easy to work with and, and uh, it's a pretty simple program uh, to administer. Um, the, the real key point out of these uh, just wanted uh, to bring up is as great as the terms are on interest, they fund a very select niche of, of projects. And uh, most of our CIP needs in the future are replacement. I mean, it's, it's replacing aging infrastructure. And that, nine times out of 10, they will not fund. So it's not 
a reliable source of funding for our greatest funding need. But things like uh, East Valley work, um, disadvantaged community, niche things on water supply, recycled water, the, where there's interest from grantors, then it makes a lot of sense to go after these. Um, obviously, internal loan uh, funds are great because we get to set the terms of that as long as they're reasonable terms. And we can change them if conditions change, uh, a depression hits or something like that, we can reevaluate that. Um, the trouble is you have to have money to loan yourself, which is the struggle. And then you usually only want to do that for short term because um, committing reserves for long periods usually doesn't make sense. Which leaves us, when we're talking about issuing debt for the future, at least planning on reliable um, funding to, to fund the CIP is bonds, is what we're, what we're largely talking about. The greatest restriction there is that to get investors to feel secure for loaning us money through bonds, uh, we have to make covenants to them. And the, two, the primary one is debt service coverage, which we'll talk about. Um, but uh, the other one, which ties in directly, is they rely on credit ratings from the official credit rating bureaus. And those credit ratings are comprehensive in their nature and what they look at. Um, and obviously, interest rates are subject to change minute by minute, depending on the market and how the market views us, and so, uh, which can be subjective as well. And is also a matter of timing and opportunity as you go out to the market. Uh, but this does, uh, it's a backstop for always being able to go to the market in, in most, most days, and so it provides us a funding source into the future. And although, and I'll just say there's a number of terms that you can design your debt as you go to the market um, for when we repay it and what basis we repay it, fixed or variable, and all sorts of different things, um, so that you can structure it to your own, uh, to the district's needs at the time. So this slide, uh, getting into key debt covenants, I know there was some question last year, so this is mostly to, to clear the air on uh, what are the actual covenants that are in place um, that, that uh, we have to abide by. Um, and so there's, there's a few, there, well, there's a lot of technical terms, but these are the primary ones of, of real concern um, for the board. And this is all governed by what we call the master resolution, which is uh, uh, an all-encompassing resolution that uh, the board approved some years ago that said any future debt that we issue is going to be governed by this. And as soon as we issued the first debt under this resolution, it sticks until we pay off all the debt uh, under this resolution. So you can't get out of it um, to, to say that much. And so that being said, um, I think primarily bonds are under, under this resolution. Um, we have to, when we set our um, budget and the rates that go with our budget, um, be projecting in, in a reasonable and honest fashion um, at least what we call 1.25 coverage on debt. And so the other way to say that is after we pay all of our operating expenses, we have to have enough revenue to not only cover our debt service payment, that's principal and interest, but another 25% on top of that. Um, and if we don't do that, we would be in technical default which is a, a different story that I'll, I'll get to in a second. But doesn't that include reserves? No, reserves are not, not part of this. You this yeah, so you don't, you, you don't get to count your reserves, no. but you also don't have to count money that you spend on capital projects, right? Y yes, so typically where you get your buffer um, on your debt service is whatever your PAYGO CIP is. That's the 25% right. or more, um, because that doesn't count against your expenses. Right. It's only operating expenses. Yeah. Uh, and so the other one, which is probably the most applicable limitation, um, is what we call the additional bonds test, which is another covenant, which says that uh, um, if we ever want to issue new debt, which is what we're looking at, and we'll probably need to do perpetually in, in the future at different intervals, uh, you have to actually achieve, not just project to achieve, um, 125 coverage in the last year. So if you're under that, you can't issue new debt. Um, and in essentially projected future years, until the projects you're thinking of are done. Um, so I just think the five-year CIP. Um, so if, you, if we haven't or we're not, um, then you can't issue new debt. And so that's probably the most practical limitation um, that, that comes into play um, on these. The, uh, the other one, I'll jump to the bottom because it ties in. So the, that's the restrictions we have under our bonds. Um, but we also have restrictions that we've covenanted with the state on SRF loans. And so any fund where we have SRF loans, these apply. And so that's domestic and sanitation only. Uh, but in this case, and there is a little bit of an update to this number, um, uh, uh, we have a, what's called a 110 coverage or 110% of debt service. But that's not on next year's debt service. That's on 
all future years, if you have your mortgage schedule, um, and if you have a spike in debt service in any year, you have to look at your highest year, and you need 110% of that, not next year. And you don't, it's not what you're projecting, you have to actually achieve that. And if you don't actually achieve that, you're in default. Now this one has probably the most stringent consequences for going into de default. I'm not sure how much this was uh, briefed to the board in, uh, in the past. But if we don't achieve the 110 coverage here, the state has the right, although they may, may not use it, so that's the, the caveat, to make us pay the entire loan immediately. So all tens of millions. If we had any pr principal forgiveness, which we have often on these, five, $10 million, 15 in aggregate, you have to pay that back. They can charge the legal maximum rate, um, which is not one or 2%, I'll just put it that way, um, and a number of other smaller things. So it's pretty catastrophic. Um, and they, they do that as the big boogeyman threat to make sure you do this. Um, so that's probably the most restrictive covenant. It, we have to do, is there a history on this with, I mean, do we know, for other agencies with SRF loans, I mean, do they, surely someone's defaulted on one somewhere along the way. Do we know what happens? I'm just curious. It sounds pretty horrible, but yeah, in reality. I, I, I think I, actually they use that as a threat and then yeah. uh, the, the, the agencies get into compliance pretty quickly. Um, I, I haven't heard of one having to do any of those things. But for the most part, the, the, the requirement here is pretty minimal. Um, yeah. So most districts should, should be able to meet this. Uh, to meet this coverage. The one caveat I was gonna say is, it's 110 now, but we have two SRF loans which are approved and active, we just haven't done the projects or drawn down on them. As soon as we do, it's the same 125 coverage. They, they increased the requirement in the last loans. And so we're really talking 125 going forward. So credit ratings. Um, I will on the outset say that this is art, not science. <laughs> Um, uh, the, each credit rating agency has their own criteria and uh, they publish these criteria and all the different things that they look at. Um, largely, well, like over 50% of those criteria really relate to two things. That's your debt service coverage ratio, which we've been talking about, and your level of reserves. Um, if uh, that's, that's the bread and butter of what the credit rating is really made out of. But there are a number of other factors which do come into play, just, just to say. Um, uh, management, stability of management, do we have capable quality people, um, board stability is a big one, lack of controversy, um, water industry or sector challenges, so for us that would be water supply. Uh, they're gonna be in, in, in depth reviewing whether shortages limit our ability to sell water or things like that if we're going into drought stages. Um, there's all sorts of qualitative aspects that go into this, not just the, the results from the financial numbers of the last audit. Um, that being said, we get a credit rating up front when we have to issue debt, uh, and that included WIFIA debt, not just bonded debt. Uh, but it can change and does change at, at any time as they, as they see fit. You will have seen that very recently with the, low, the regional banking crisis, a number of downgrades that happened within a day of them getting information. Um, we regularly get either annual or biannual surveillance uh, which is when they routinely review our numbers. Um, and that, that is typically when you would see any change. We have one from Fitch going on right now, so we may get news any time now of either them confirming or uh, uh, in the most likely sense, possibly lowering um, any of our credit ratings that we have with Fitch. And with them, it's only the stormwater bonds, which, which are pretty solid, so we'll, we'll see where that comes in. So Rick, can they lower the, bond, the, the rate after it's been issued? Yes, and they often do. So another question, the, um, on the summary page, the, the uh, 2022 A bonds that were rated AAA by Fitch, is, do they have, does that have a lower rate? Because it's of it's that currently AAA. AAA. It's currently AAA. So it has a lower rate. That would be the that highest bond. rating. The high, well, I meant, yeah, that's what yes. I meant. And so why were they not rated on uh, the uh, 21 and 22 revenue bonds? Why is Fitch not, why is there no rating there? Uh, when you do each issuance, there's, there's sort of a market analysis of is it worth it to go through the effort of the additional rating. Mm -hmm. um, they're very expensive, um, sometimes up to $100,000 per rating. Uh, and so if you don't think you're gonna get that much of a market advantage from having an additional rating, and usually only do multiple ratings, sometimes up to three on very large issuances, 
Um, if it's not worth it, it's not worth it. And so one rating is required. And you usually pick the one you think is going to be the most favorable agency to you um, at the time. So Stormwater, we did two because um, in total, it was $100 million plus in issuance. It was a large issuance, and it was worth so, it. So is that recommended then by your investment team? Uh, by our municipal advisors. By our yeah. advisors. So okay. that would be PFM for us. OK, thanks. So uh, the, as I mentioned, the two key things are debt service coverage and we say liquidity or reserves. Um, the question is what rating we should be going after. And so this is where the art, not science, comes in. As a, as a general sort of insight, and this is subject to change over time, certainly with discussion with you all, um, uh, I would say, and this is my professional opinion, uh, a double A negative is probably the sweet spot. Um, for instance, and the best way I can illustrate this, uh, and this is purely examples made of numbers, but it's, it shows the scale. Uh, a triple A rating might require us to have 500 million in reserves and three, three plus times coverage, All right? So three times our debt, our, our mortgage payment in, in net revenue. Um, but a double A might be 250 million and a double A negative might be 200, but there might only be a half a percent difference in between uh, the interest rate on those. And so yes, triple A is the best, but you only get an incremental savings to get that top, top credit rating. Um, and double A negative is usually the best interest rate for the least amount of effort, if I can put it that way. Um, and uh, obviously, building up those reserves and that coverage means higher rates. And so that's, that's the offset that you're trying to manage against. Um, and then just as a last point, uh, ultimately, no matter what their ratings guidance says, it's, it's a game of peer review or peer comparison. Um, they're going to look uh, at us against similar large water utilities, especially here in California. And uh, if, let's say, Met is rated a AA plus or AA, and they have three times coverage and three years worth of cash on hand, and we have a quarter of that, there's no way that we're going to get a AA plus. Um, just, to, just to say it that way, you're graded on a curve. Um, and so we do have to be aware of what the other um, similar sort of agencies that investors are looking at on, on similar notes are, are, are doing and how they're, how they're faring. So I would be remiss to talk about debt without talking about other debt than just the, the bonds that we have and the bonds that we need to have. Um, and the primary one to put on scale, so that $360 million number that I shared does not include our CalPERS ob obligations. Uh, that, at least as of the end of last fiscal year, was another $142 million um, in unfunded liability that we'll have to pay. That number changes by the day. so. It's a ballpark, um, take it as a ballpark number, uh, because it's based on actuarial analysis and how the market value of the assets and the fund. Um, and so, but it gives you a sense of, of uh, uh, scale um, compared to our other debts. Uh, that $142 million is, is for sure going to increase, uh, at least over this next year, because uh, as long as CalPERS earns less than 6.8% on their investment return, they, they add to the, the number they're getting under what they assumed. And so, and they did last year. Um, they were at negative seven point something. And uh, they are currently this year, will be uh, happy to break even um, for the year, which is certainly under 6.8%. And so all of that to say, um, uh, it's a large number, but we do have a, a plan. It's actually a pretty reasonable plan, I believe, um, to pay this off in a fairly short order and save some money in the process while not adding any, any uh, a special additional amount of rate pressure. And so that, that plan to put it shortly if the, if the board agrees, and we can talk about this in more detail in future meetings, but just to give you a, a high level preview, is uh, we have been trying to manage this liability. It's, it was even larger um, uh, and have been paying more than the contractual minimum to CalPERS. And so if we stay at where we're at now, if I put it that way, um, no matter what CalPERS says is the technical minimum, um, and we stay at that level and we just increase that level uh, by however much our payroll is increasing. So if our payroll grows up 3% next year, we would increase the payment by 3% to just stay proportionally equal. Then uh, we believe we can pay this off in 12 years versus 22 years, as the actuaries would say, and um, uh, at a $36 million savings. So that wouldn't add anything special to rates that we're talking about in the future. It pays it off in a reasonable amount of time. And if we don't do that, it'll get up to the level that we would be at now anyways uh, within a few short years because they'll ramp up the payments. So we might as well stay where we're at um, and pay it down. Um, 
I'll stop there if there are any particular questions because CalPERS can be a complicated subject. So, so what is the source of repayment? So, so it's, uh, this obligation is broken up between all the funds in various proportions, usually the labor breakdown. Um, domestic has a little less than 50% of, of the, the labor budget, so it's paying a little less than 50%. And so it's, it's built into the rates and so it's operating, an operating expenses. An operating it's an operating rate. expense. And then is this something that you would ever consider bonding for to pay off? Uh, that, that's a subject of financial debate on, on theory. Um, some cities and counties, especially that are very, very bad off, uh, have thought it advantageous to issue a whole bunch of debt mm -hmm. at what they think is lower interest rate than they can get in the investment. You know, you issue a whole bunch of bonds at 2%, let's just say, and think that you can earn 5% by putting them in the market or giving it to CalPERS. And so in the end, you're saving a whole bunch of money. Uh, you have to guarantee that you're actually making more than the interest rate. And a lot of agencies have not achieved that because the market acts in yeah, different ways than you expect. So it's a little risky. Um, okay. And I, I probably wouldn't recommend that okay, with our thanks. situation. I was curious. Um, so the only other things, and I'll, I'll get through these ones pretty quick because I think the board's pretty aware of it. But just to note, we do have a line of credit with Bank of the West. It's currently 25 million. That only applies to CIP projects on domestic sanitation and stormwater. It's not available for each one. Pretty minimal cost to maintain a line of credit, a little over $60,000. Um, but you, in essence, if we took out money on this line, we would pay a short-term interest rate. The trouble now, which is a very odd thing in, in financial markets, is you pay more on short-term than you do on long-term. So we would be paying 4% uh, to, to pay on this in the current market, um, which doesn't make any sense at all unless you really needed the cash to, to pay on a temporary basis for the project. Uh, currently, it expires in 2025. It might be useful as bridge financing for the USDA loan if, if we get into a timing issue, which is what the next slide talks about, that we issued revenue notes, which aren't the same as long-term bonds, uh, which are only out, outstanding for another couple of years. And that was because we needed to pay upfront for the USDA loan projects and then transfer that debt to, to that federal program. Um, and so we have this money outstanding. It'll pay for the projects. If there's anything left over, uh, because I don't think it'll take the full 35, uh, then we use the leftover amount to pay off that portion of the debt. So it just gets used to pay itself off in the end, and the leftover amount gets rolled into the new federal debt at the much lower interest rate. And then lastly, which we've already brought up in this discussion, the interfund loan, um, that's, that's 51 million, that was from the domestic fund. So this is money going in the repayment cycle from West Rack to domestic, um, it funded the Mid Valley Pipeline. So when this was approved, uh, it was, there was essentially two major terms associated with it. The interest rate, which is what we're actually earning on our investment returns plus a 10% premium. So if we're earning 1%, it's 1.1% that we're paying back. Um, but there was no set repayment schedule. We essentially said if there's leftover money from net revenues at the end of the year, um, then we'll, we'll use that, that, that excess to repay it. Um, it's most appropriate, I'll just put it that way, to have some sort of set repayment schedule. Um, accounting standards require it. Other, other things uh, would say it's a best practice. Um, so I'm proposing from this point, this budget year that we're talking about going forward, a 15-year repayment uh, period. It's roughly about $3.9 million per year. This would not increase rates on West Rack in and of itself, actually. We think we can afford it within the existing amounts. Um, I'm going to say up front that if we don't do this, um, I'll put it this way, the domestic funds are relying on this money to not have to raise rates even more than what we're talking about in future in the other presentation. And so if we do anything other than this, we'll have to come up with some financing or funding mechanism in domestic. Um, right now, the, fun, the domestic funds are relying on it. Uh, and so the actual interest rate, unless we fix it at a point in time, um, would vary, but it's about 2%. So it's pretty attractive um, and uh, uh, for the West Rack Fund. Hey, Rick, just a question on the first item there. That, the 2022A revenue notes, that's not on the detailed page no. part of the 30, 368 million. Why not? Be, that this, was, this was something I was trying really hard to make sure I was giving you something useful versus technical. So although the debt is outstanding, uh, the amounts that will actually remain once the bonds, 
the, these bonds mature, will get transferred into the USDA loan. So it was more appropriate to show the USDA loan. All right. So you would have been counting it twice if you yeah, showed it. I would have been it. counting it twice. All right. Yeah. I got you. Fair enough. So just to reiterate, um, going with this uh, repayment schedule will not affect rates? No. It, it'll be within within the rates that, that we currently have. Any Anything that we're talking about rate increases on West Rock would be from other, other pressures. Okay. Thanks. So new debt. Um, uh, the mentioned up front, the 99 million, um, the key here is it's really three funds that we're talking about, oh, roughly a third a piece or about 33 million a piece, sanitation, stormwater, and domestic. Um, we're not looking at a bond issuance next year. There's a few reasons for that. It would actually be in, and probably in FY26, so a couple years out. Um, putting it in the middle of the CIP makes it easiest to fund projects both at the beginning of the CIP and the end of the CIP. Um, right now, the uh, uh, tax-exempt interest rates on, on 30-year municipal debt are still attractive. I mean, oh, I think we could reasonably get 4% in the current market. You compare that to mortgage rates now in the 6 to 7 or 7 plus percent range, and, um, and it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable. Um, so we're not talking astronomic interest rates, even though the Federal Reserve is, is hiking. Um, and so the only uh, other key detail here is uh, if we're going to do this, and it's just a matter of, of uh, being conservative up front, um, the board needs to approve a reimbursement resolution in, as part of this budget where we just identify the projects uh, that we're talking about and say we may uh, need to issue debt for these. It doesn't obligate us to issue debt. Um, but if we do issue debt, it allows us to go backwards and reimburse ourselves. So it gives us options where we wouldn't otherwise have that option. The projects we're going to talk about, I'll leave mostly to, to Carrie to go into the detail in the next presentation, but just to show you which ones. Uh, these are really what I would call uh, core projects to each of these funds. Um, like, for instance, on the domestic side, uh, uh, several key mainline replacement projects, Adams, Sun City, Talavera, uh, key booster station replacement, um, and, and reservoir. Um, sanitation, we're talking key improvements. Uh, at the work facilities and uh, stormwater, um, uh, some key projects there as well uh, that, that I know the board's been discussing. So um, it, in total, it's 99 million. Some of the projects have some other funding, which is why the numbers don't exactly line up. And we would be trying to reimburse ourselves for some expenses like design engineering that we've already incurred. We can go backwards and reimburse for that as well. So just to round out the presentation, this new debt, the 99 million we're estimating would cost district-wide uh, another 5.7 million per year. So just as, as sort of key numbers, our existing debt costs us about 10 million per year in debt service. Once we add in these other programs, which are in the works that have already been approved, but we haven't drawn down on, that goes from 10 to 20 million. And once we add in this additional debt, we get up to 25 which in, in all respects and context is pretty reasonable for an entity of our size, 500 million budget, multiple billion in, in, in assets. And then just to show, obviously we've been talking, everything's on a per fund basis, that's how we manage. And so you get the, mm -hmm. the context of uh, each fund's activity on the debt service and, and when and how that kind of kicks in. The purple one's probably the most striking because that's the West replenishment. Um, that interfund loan, that 15 years I just mentioned. And so that takes that into consideration. Uh, sanitation, domestic, and canal, uh, you'll notice have the, the most significant increases in debt from where we are now, which is where most of the rate pressure is when, you see, when we talk rates at the, at the end of uh, the, today's presentations. So with that, I'll mm -hmm. leave it for any additional questions. I, I have some, and these are just, these are general comments. They're not really questions, but just comments for the record. Um, well, I'll start off with, with comments, but uh, you know, one of one of the projects that I uh, I've had the most trouble understanding since I've been here um, have been related to stormwater, and uh, and I and I say that in general uh, for the engineering department for the board. Um, I, I have a hard time understanding what components of stormwater projects are 
projects that we pay for, that we bond for, uh, which components of projects are those that are related to individual projects that developers are responsible for building and then at some point turning over to the district. Um, I think just recently we've, we've, we've I think, focused pretty heavily on um, the, the Indio flood channels. Um, there's about a hundred million dollars worth of projects there. Uh, I, I did see that they were combined with the Avenue 54 to the thermal uh, air, uh, airport. So I don't recall the specific numbers on what goes to Indio flood channels versus what went to mm. the um, Avenue 54 to airport. And then there are some more projects here uh, around also on stormwater. Uh, uh, Sun City. And I'm trying to figure out if that's a continuation of that, of those Indio flood channels or where they're really at in relation to, to that project. And, and I get that we're trying to somehow funnel all those flows through those developments. Um, but that's just kind of my general question is, is, uh, you know, how, how do we get here? And then where does that water go now? Um, um, has, I imagine maybe it's been a historic issue with, with flooding in, in that area. I, I'm just really trying to understand how we identified those projects as kind of being the, the priority projects that um, we've kind of focused on in, in recent years. And I think we're continuing to uh, further make investments in, in that area. And so, and, and I just, I really want to understand that just because in my effort to sometimes try to um, highlight the need for a uh, certain infrastructure uh, in other parts of the valley, uh, I, 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 I seem to uh, not have all the pieces together on, on how uh, certain projects make it uh, to the list and then uh, other proposals maybe don't make it to the list. So I kind of say that in general, just uh, because I, I, I truly uh, have had a difficult time uh, understanding stormwater projects. Uh, I know that uh, it's not a big fund. Uh, we have a special tax uh, for, for that fund that, that we impose uh, on everybody in the Coachella Valley within our stormwater boundary. And it doesn't generate a lot of revenue. That's why I think we're having to tap into some debt here because these are big projects. But I, I really, really want to make an effort to understand, you know, why we're focusing in certain areas and and, uh, and maybe it's because it's driven by development and maybe that's the answer but um if that's the answer then i'd just like to get some clarity that that's the answer and then at what point do we negotiate with developers on who you know builds what and at what point do we agree that we're gonna finance certain infrastructure uh, but these, these are big projects and and they do have a significant impact, I think, in the communities that, that infrastructure is built or not built. And so, uh, in general, those are my comments related to um, to stormwater. And I, I know that you said that uh, this is kind of looking at the five-year CIP. And um, I know in the past we've seen a, a long list of projects, so I know that it's not it doesn't include all the projects. So I don't know if, uh, Jim, maybe you can help me out here, but I don't know if all those projects would be in the CIP with, for the further, uh, for the outer years, just to kind of get a sense of perhaps what didn't make it into this five year uh, bracket. Um, and just to continue to have a sense of what might be pending outside of this uh, five year bracket. Yeah, so if uh, if I may, first, yes, we'd be happy to bring back a study session on the stormwater, how staff develops the priorities, um, what funding is available, how we can pursue that funding to actually make that project a reality. Um, it, it is a huge responsibility uh, that the district has, having been formed as a stormwater agency, 
um, it, it is a constant challenge to find the resourcing to be able to do that. A lot of times development uh, precedes um, the protection that is then required and, and development can proceed so long as it's under certain conditions. Um, we've got a number of communities now that are required to buy flood insurance because there are no existing stormwater facilities out there to provide protection. And then we have to go through a process with FEMA to develop uh, conditional letters of um, permits, those types of things. Um, but we'd be happy to bring that back. As far as what is in the CIP, we have, I think, tried a number of different ways to bring that information to the board. Um, unfortunately, it's my, I guess, perception that the board really focuses on the year uh, that the budget is being developed for and not so much on the four or five years beyond that. Um, expecting, you know, situations, revenues to change, situations, conditions to change. Um, and so it wasn't, I mean, we would provide binders, like three, four inch binders full of projects and project materials. Um, and it just, we just decided, well, if the board's only gonna focus on the current year, then let's focus on the current year. But we do have a plan, we just don't speak to it during these sessions because it gets into issues of priority and that's what we've, that's what staff is there to do. Yeah, and, and so I don't know if, I, and I remember those big binders and, and uh, Project data sheets and project data, Yeah, and everybody put in all their projects in there. I'm just uh, trying to figure out, you know, who I need to speak to or, or, or if it's embedded in a and the uh, budget uh, uh, does the well, budget yeah. the budget the budget covers five years, right? Does no, this budget year? this budget covers one year. This this is okay, it's, but the, uh, the 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 debt. So the, we we put together a five year CIP, um, and we show that in the um, in the overall sheets we show, but the presentation today is focused on next year only. So, FY24 projects. Right, so Rick mentioned that in the five-year plan, in order to fund that, it's gonna require $99 million of new debt. Right, and some of those projects were, they're in design and we may be initiating construction next year. There's one project we've initiated construction on. Um, and as I go through my presentation, I'll highlight those as these are the identified projects that um, are on the $99 million list. Um, just so you can get an idea of, of where they're at. Um, this is one, one more, just follow up on the stormwater. Sure. When we when we talk about that, can we talk about the funding that comes from that and, and what it takes to increase the funding? It would be a vote of the people. Okay. And I can't remember whether it's a two thirds or three quarters vote, but it's a tax and that tax increment has to be, can only be raised by a vote. And so what we try and do is assess the revenue that we're currently getting along with the increase in property values and use that to pay the debt coverage or burden on any funding we get so that we don't have to go back and raise the rate. But there is a significant, there's over $2 billion worth of work out there. But there is, and, and so the, the districts, we, we, we had a huge stockpile of cash for a long time, right, in this fund. Well, it's been about 70 million. I don't know that that's huge compared to the 2 billion that's required, but. No, 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 but compared to the other funds, we had more money in there. Than you had more, we had, we have had more money in stormwater than we have had in the other funds. But, but as we found out that these projects are huge, mm -hmm. huge. And so the amount of projects that we have, like you're saying, are, I mean, we can't, you know, I'm just looking ahead. I'm looking to the next 20 years. How do you eat an elephant, right? Yeah, that's correct. And I'm also looking at, you know, if we're gonna to have to issue $100 million worth of debt for just the next five year CIP, what does the next five years after that and the next five years look like mm -hmm. that? I mean, you, you know, and, and so you're talking about doubling and tripling rates, you know, ever, every five years or, or we, we really sit down and think about all the projects that need to be done because, you know, that 100, in the next five years, the debt issuance may be you know, $150 million to do the same amount of projects the way costs go up. So I'm a little concerned about about that. 
or that this position. But having come from to, a, I'd love to go through my presentation for you. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to let him know okay. our thoughts and then. <laughs> yeah, and another something to keep in mind, having come from a, a, an agency that had a much greater uh, infrastructure valuation, uh, constantly being under pressure to try and find ways to do more with less. Uh, the rule of thumb is you should be investing two to three percent annually um, based on the value of your total assets. So if your total assets are billions and billions of dollars, you should be investing, you know, two or three percent of that every year just to maintain what you already have or you fall further and further behind. And then you've got problems of failure or interruption of service. Uh, two and three percent is just, it's just a rule of thumb. I, I don't, you know, and, some researchers have done uh, that. I, I did do some rough, rough estimates. Um, years of life. Where, if you look at domestic, just the irrigation and drainage distribution system, not even the canal and sanitation, where our estimated infrastructures in the six and a half million, billion, billion, um, are percent of overall system that we're replacing, um, a half percent to one percent, depending on the fund. So, so one would say, based on that rule of thumb that the Department of Defense uses, we're underfunding our maintenance. I understand, but I'm sure the federal government doesn't doesn't do that either. Well, I mean, the Department of Defense is because that number grows so much every year. I mean, you know, I think in the last 10 years, it was it maybe the whole total district was was in the low billions, and now you're talking one fund, six billion, one, you know. Oh, that was for three funds. That was for three funds, okay. Yeah. Domestic sanitation, and there's the pipeline and drainage facilities and canals. I, I hear you. I hear you. I'm not trying to be difficult. I hear you. No, I'm just, I'm not either. I'm just trying to, you know, yeah. no, put things in perspective, I guess. Is that it. Okay, go ahead, Carrie. Okay. Um, can we pull can up the pull CIP? Up there we go. Presentation? Yep. Okay, so um, I'm going to, good afternoon. I'm going to go through. Um, this is the agenda. I'm going to go through the budget, look at this year versus um, next year. And we're going to go through each of the funds, um, the completed projects, the projected execution rates, and um, the proposed projects. So um, starting here, this is just an overall summary by funding source of the proposed FY24 budget. So the total amount is approximately 141 million. And this slide shows the various funding sources. There's pay-as-you-go funds, which is shown there in the second column. And that makes up about 27% of the budget, 38 million. Our grants, loans, bonds, um, that makes up about 64% of the budget, um, 90 million. And then we have some restricted reserve projects, which are our developer fee funded um, funds. And that makes up about 9% of the budget. So I think this slide shows we're doing a good job of uh, finding outside funding sources um, to complete our projects. Without the grants and loans, we'd have a relatively small CIP. Um, however, as uh, Rick just described, in his presentation, there's still a need to do more, especially when it comes to replacing or rehabilitating our existing infrastructure. Um, the loans and grants, they don't tend to fund projects in non-disadvantaged communities. So projects like the Sun City water main replacements, the Talavera water main replacements, those are gonna require bond financing in the upcoming years since there are not sufficient pay-as-you-go funds. Are there any questions? Gary, the- this um, slide? Uh, what, what is your, uh, and I realize, Steph, you guys have done a great job on getting out, outside money. Um, what, what is the outlook, you think, for grant money in the next next year or so? Do we see new sources, or do you feel like we're maxing out the available um, funds that are being uh, presented to us? or Because uh, well, weren't we going to hire a, a grant person or... We, we have a, um, a lot of projects um, that have been 
where we've gotten the letter saying you've been awarded the money, but we haven't gotten the money yet. So next year is going to be really focused on on trying to get the funds. You know, we're right at the end of trying to get the, the funding agreements by the end of this year. Next year we'll be starting the construction and starting to spend mm -hmm. those funds. So we're constantly looking for um, or submitting applications for new projects, especially, especially in the East Valley, because we know it takes two to three years to get the funds. So, so okay, that's so good. That's that's where we're at. We're not stopping. We're, we're no, continuing I didn't, I didn't as well as that. with recycled water projects. That's on a cycle as well. Um, we submit for an application at the end of the year. It, it takes a year or so before we hear. We're we're constantly. So, Carrie, for example, on the on domestic, they're on grant. That doesn't show the twenty four million from the state because we haven't received it. Is right. It, we we budgeted, um, I think, five million for the Avenue sixty six project. Um, what happened this year is we budgeted thirteen million, and we're not going to see any of that money. So, it we had. It makes it look like we have a really large CIP and then that we didn't spend anything. But so what I'm doing is I'm not budgeting quite as much on the grants because they don't have an impact on the rates. So if for some reason we get the funding and we get it earlier than we thought mm -hmm. and we need to increase the budget to increase the grant amount, um, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to say I need to do a budget amendment to increase my, my bottom line but it's grant funding it doesn't have a rate impact. Yeah, and, and you guys have done such an amazing job on water and sewer. I mean, you, you probably are close to what, 50 million? 70. 70? Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, All right, so I'm gonna move on. All right, so this one is just um, the comparison slide that I, I've been showing you in the past. So the, the, the second column there, FY23 approved budget, this is where we started um, in Ju July 1st of 2022. Um, we were at 180 million. Um, due to um, changes that have occurred since June, um, as of March 1st, we amended that budget. So that's the third column there, they amended budget. So we amended it by 44 million. And a couple of the reasons why we, we reduced it, um, one is there were just delays in starting construction because of long lead times on, on materials and supplies. And then, um, like I described earlier, just working through the grant and loan funding requirements, um, we anticipated getting some of those um, grant funds and, and uh, we just haven't gotten the agreements yet. Carrie? Yes. That 180 was approved budget? Yes, or that is. is carry or or some of that is carry over from the year before. Well, the 180 um, was the approved budget. It it included the two very large stormwater projects, the 81 million there, and um, <coughs> domestic. Like I said, it included 13 million of the Avenue 66 project with the grant funds. Um, sanitation had um, they they initiated that, the very large um, uh, non-potable water projects, all those connections along Hovely here in the, in the pump station. So there, there were some very large projects that were initiated. Okay. Okay, so then the fourth column is the, the fiscal year 24, the previously approved budget. This was what was, um, what we had projected spending back in June um, for this upcoming year. So that was at 164. You can see we've reduced it um, today. Our proposed budget is 141 for next year. And some of the reasons, again, um, just a result, we're spreading out some of the projects due to um, the funding constraints we've, we've mentioned today, as well as workload. We currently have um, three open positions in engineering, so we just need to adjust our projects with the resources that we have. Okay, we, now um, we're gonna go into each fund in a little more detail, um, and we're gonna start with motor pool. So Stuart Taylor is gonna come up and go over the uh, motor pool 
plan. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Carrie. President Powell, mm -hmm. Vice President Strada, distinguished members of the board. I'm here to discuss the proposed FY24 motor pool capital improvement budget. <clears throat> the first slide is simply uh, an extension of our commitment that we started back in 2018 to the board that we would keep our capital improvement budget at 2.5 million a year and do everything in our power to to meet that commitment and so for fy24 through 28 we're going we're going to continue in that effort and do everything we can to to stay within that uh that budget commitment um if i could get the next slide <clears throat> So next we wanna talk about the capital improvement budget. And if you'll bear with me just a few minutes, I'd like to provide some context into uh, how we got to this specific uh, FY24 budget. Um, back in FY22, um, we uh, had a capital improvement budget of 2,469,000, which included uh, some heavy duty trucks uh, that we had been working uh, very hard with the South Coast Air Quality Management District to get approvals for technical infeasibility certification requests, or TICRs. Uh, as we worked through that process, we did place orders for those trucks. There were seven uh, heavy-duty chassis. We also had some uh, F-Series heavy-duty trucks, F-550s, and one F-750. Um, as we went through uh, that Fiscal year, um, obviously everybody uh, is aware of the uh, supply chain problems and issues that were related to manufacturing of vehicles and chip shortages and all the different things they came up with of why they couldn't provide a vehicle. Uh, so FY22, we ended up with one piece of equipment that we got delivered out of that whole uh, budget, which was a disc for the stormwater <laughs> group. Uh, everything else we had to reevaluate and, and we rebudgeted for FY23. So uh, because we were uh, talking with the South Coast and we had uh, been getting some feedback from them, uh, we chose to simply rebudget the seven heavy duty Kenworth chassis that we had the approvals for the TICRs as well as the four F550 chassis, which are utility beds with cranes. And then we had one F750, which was going to be a smaller dump body, an eight yard dump body. So we rebudgeted those, and then with the remaining budget dollars, we put in uh, 17 half-ton uh, battery electric pickups, which was uh, in an effort to uh, use those to mitigate um, for compliance with the South Coast. So if we put in zero emission vehicles, they would count those against some of the vehicles they said we didn't meet their compliance rules for. Um, so two things happened for in this current uh, fiscal year. Number one, Kenworth, uh, reached out to us and said, we're canceling all seven of your chassis. Uh, we can't build them for you, which was a big problem because we've been working so hard uh, with the South Coast. And then when we went out to bid for the 17 half ton pickups of battery electric, we got zero bids. Um, the manufacturers are focusing on the uh, consumer market, not on a fleet market or, or a government agency type of a market. And they started putting significant premiums on those vehicles. They were nudging up towards $100,000 each. And we anticipated the original manufacturer's suggested price was gonna be in the low 40s. Um, so we uh, worked hard with Kenworth and we had several meetings with them. Uh, and Dan and I were able to have a meeting with the executive vice president of uh, Inland Kenworth. And he said he understood uh, our concerns of not getting the chassis, but they thought maybe they could help us by building one or two. Turns out that they were able to get our seven allocations and they're actually built and uh, they're starting to deliver to Inland Kenworth. So we anticipate getting those uh, in this fiscal year, which again is significant because South Coast had approved those seven uh, TICRs. So that's a huge um, step forward in our compliance efforts with them. And it'll establish us for many, many years to come on our heavy duty side. Um, so with that said, um, we rebudgeted those trucks and we added those half ton pickups. We didn't get any bids and that brings me to the FY24. So uh, you'll notice that the top line in blue is the one truck that we're anticipating having to rebudget for this uh, FY24, which is the F750 
they canceled that chassis, we have to reorder it and start over. Um, but because they canceled it, we get on the top of a queue when we get that back into the system. So we anticipate that will come in uh, in this fiscal year. So we rebudgeted that. You'll see that we added 25 battery electric utility vehicles or what we will call an EUV. So we had to step back and regroup based on what we were seeing for prices and availability for the half ton pickups. And we said, what is available out there in the market and what would meet the need of the district? Do we have to have a half ton pickup? Can we do something else? So uh, we looked at the Chevrolet Bolt, the Chevrolet Equinox, um, Chevrolet Blazer is gonna be coming out in an electric only version. The Bolt really fit a model for what we could utilize within the meter reader group. Uh, we spoke to Scott uh, Bird and uh, Daniel Colorado and, and they feel uh, confident that's something they could utilize and we could take advantage of that zero emission vehicle and continue on our quest to use those vehicles to offset some of the heavy duty stuff. Uh, so what we did is we identified the 25 highest cost, highest mile half ton pickups that we have in our fleet. We're going to push those out to auction. We're going to take the uh, Chevrolet Bolt or EUV vehicles and push those into the meter reader and a couple of them within the um, water management group. And then those lower mile, lower cost vehicles will move back over to the folks that have the high mile stuff. So we'll kind of get a win-win uh, moving some vehicles around that way. Are those pickups or what? Those are, they're, they're a small utility vehicle, like a small SUV. Yeah, so they're like a four-door. Kind of like a sedan. A mid-compact, yeah. They're, they're more of a, a, what I would call a, a, like a Chevrolet. It reminds me kind of of a Blazer, but in a smaller version. Um, but yeah, it's a cross between a car and a, and a utility vehicle. Do you have the infrastructure for that? Right, so I was gonna, uh, yeah, I was getting to that. So we also do have that in our budget uh, to put 20 uh, battery charging stations here at the Palm Desert campus. So all those vehicles would, locate here so we can you know have them in one area so we can address any you know issues that come up from uh, taking on a new vehicle like this that we haven't had we'll put uh, 20 charging stations down the so south side of the uh palm desert ops building uh and that is in our in our budget so they don't take those vehicles home those guys no okay no and we can rotate in with the number of miles we do we can easily manage that and they're they're level two chargers so we don't get into the really heavy infrastructure stuff with those yet um so they're a, it's a good kind of stop gap measure if i can put it that way or an intermediate measure for longer term things um so that's what we'll do with those 25 vehicles uh and then you'll uh, also note that we have a vector truck um the, so the last uh four to five vehicles at the bottom of this sheet uh, we have two Vactor trucks in the fleet, they're 2015 model year. The chassis are in good condition uh, and we don't wanna have to replace those, obviously for compliance reasons, uh, but the, the actual service uh, portion of that truck, the Vactor portion, uh, can be refurbished by Acre and they'll do that for 225,000, which sounds like a lot of money, um, but a brand new truck is about 750,000 each. So uh, we're gonna take advantage of that program to refurbish those uh, you know, service portion of those trucks and uh, try to get more reliability out of those. We're starting to see some more uh, visits to the shop and we wanna provide those uh, uh, folks higher reliability with their vehicle. We have two older diesel um, service body with crane trucks, we call them maintainers. Uh, we'll replace those with F750 gasoline chassis. And then we have also, you'll note an F600 fuel truck. So we have a, a large 58,000 GVWR fuel truck that we utilize at the auto shop for refueling purposes. Uh, and we also have a smaller one that we use to tow uh, the portable generators uh, to sites when needed, and it'll do the smaller fuel operations. We're gonna eliminate those two diesel trucks and replace it with this one gas truck, and it's gonna be kind of a hybrid, so it'll still be able to tow our emergency generators, uh, the portable ones, it'll be able to do the refueling operations as well as uh, do the servicing on the stationary generator sites. Um, so again, we are gonna eliminate six diesels and replace them with four gasoline. And then the final one is a battery electric cart for the warehouse here in Palm Desert. Their old one is uh, pretty dilapidated, so they just need it to, to shuttle about the campus and, and uh, take care of their day-to-day -day business. Um, and with that, uh, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Great, thanks. Sure.
Thanks, Stuart. Okay. Good. Thanks, Stuart. Um, I want to do a really quick time check because I know this is only supposed to go till three. Is that is that whatever you want me to try to target three o'clock? I don't know how you're going to get this done by three, but. Well, I can I can um, I can speed it up a little, and but please stop me if there's any okay. point when you have go a question or you okay. want me to slow down. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, general district, um, we completed the salt and nutrient management plan monitoring wells, and the projected execution rate for the end of this year is 93%. Um, just a general reminder, general district projects are funded by each of the other funds. So this is the breakdown. Um, the total uh, budget for general district projects is almost $5 million this year. As you can see, domestic water makes up the majority of of the um, fund, um, or the, the, yeah, the funds for this, for this, uh, for general district. We have um, eight projects. Um, we have the SCIDA master plan system uh, replacement and upgrade, that's an ongoing. We have the information systems infrastructure upgrade, also ongoing. We have the audio and visual upgrade in, in this boardroom, ongoing. We're going to do a phase two of the salt and nutrient management plan monitoring wells. Um, we're going to finish the Palm Desert Demo Garden. That is grant funded, as well as a portion of the monitoring wells are grant funded. Um, the Palm Desert upgrade transfer switch that will um, help the um, uh, ops building here in Palm Desert. And we're going to work on the Palm Desert Operations parking lot, as well as continue our planning with the new enterprise resource planning and utility, utility billing system. All of these projects, except for the $130,000, which, um, which is the grant funding for the demo garden and the monitoring wells, the, we use uh, pay-as-you-go funds for all of these projects. So I'm going to um, go th skip through these slides. They just talk about the ones that aren't ongoing. Kerry, you may have noticed they've all got hard copies of these now. So. Okay, great. So I'm going to move into domestic. So in domestic, um, we finished uh, the design of this Via De Anza project, and we had to replace this uh, pipe support on um, a portion of the Highway 6 transmission main that was located within a wash. So um, that was that was completed. Um, like I said in the beginning, the majority of, of this fund was focused on grant-related projects that we just didn't get the funding agreements for. So, um, this next year, the budget is estimated to be $40 million. 64% um, of the budget is being funded by loans and grants. Um, we have 22 projects. Seven of them are ongoing, um, and these are just for reference um, how the funds, how the different projects are being funded. Um, like I talked about earlier, some of our we have a small amount, almost three million, being funded with restricted funds. Um, about eight million being funded with the pay-as-you-go, and. Then there's some slides here just about some of the, the, the new projects, not the ongoing projects, the ones that haven't started construction. So there's the Via De Anza water main replacement project in uh, Cathedral City. There's a well rehab project, which is a strategic initiative where we're going to look at um, trying to um, get a well back in service um, by rehabbing it rather than um, re-drilling it. Um, there's the... Uh, uh, chromium, uh, a full-scale stannous chloride chromium-6 treatment project um, that we're hoping to get approval from the um, Division of Drinking Water to implement. Um, and then these are all of our grant and loan projects. There's three booster stations, um, three reservoirs, multiple um, mainline replacement projects, and then the Three at the bottom there are ones that I think you've heard of um, quite often. The Valley View Consolidation Project, which is in the East Valley, the Avenue 66 Transmission Main, and the um, Ion Exchange Treatment Plant 7991 Replacement Project. 
So out of the grant and loan projects, that's 20, almost $26 million. These are just um, detailed slides of all of those projects for reference. If you have any questions, I'm happy to talk more about any of these projects. But I am going to just keep going, as long as you say keep going. All right, so then we have the canal fund. And in the canal fund, we are anticipating completing these three projects. The design, that's done for the mid-canal storage project, the Johnson Street drain improvement project, and phase one of the irrigation model 11964-75 project. Um, so again, um, with uh, 60 million, 58 million um, in USBR loan funding, um, that's the majority of the funding for this um, fund and for the projects next year. There's one project that we're using pay-as-you-go funding, and that's for the L4 pump station. Um, that one is an ongoing project. Um, we're just having some issues with getting the electrical panels and equipment, so that one is being carried over to next year as well. So, um, again, uh, there's a lot of slides here on the... Um, the detail um, projects. Um, but I think you've seen most of these um, because they are all of the, all the projects that are included in the 60 million. Any questions so far? Canal or domestic? Okay. East Rack, um, this one's fairly easy. We have um, two, two projects. Um, Pay as you go is 1.8 million, and then the bond financing of 100,000, and that's just to wrap up any remaining items with the Oasis in Lou Recharge project. We're hoping to have that finished by the end of this fiscal year, by June 30th. Um, but just in case there's some carryover items, we've budgeted some money for next year. And then the quarry is the other um, project where we're working on a feasibility study to see about a non-flowable water connection to that uh, to that uh, country club. So there's a detailed slide on that. Okay, um, then we have stormwater. So um, completed projects this year. Um, the East Side Dyke Improvement Project Phase One. We finished the environmental on the Thousand Palms Flood Control Project, which was huge. Um, that means we can start land acquisition. Um, we're completing the East Side Dyke Realignment Design and Environmental, um, and we're completing the design of the Thousand Palms Channel Project, which is um, different than the Thousand Palms Flood Control Project, which I can show you on a slide. So, um, again, this, this fund is made up mostly of um, pay-as-you-go, uh, would be a loan, and bond financing. So it's a $41 million um, proposed budget, and there are 13 projects. Three of them are ongoing. Those three ongoing projects are, well, mainly two of them make up um, $37 million of the $41 million budget. And those are the, the Coachella Valley Stormwater Channel improvements from Avenue 54 to Thermal Drop, and then the North Indio Regional Flood Control Project. So um, the pay-as-you-go money is uh, about $10.5 million, and the grant loan bond financing projects are about $30, $31 million. So these are all the projects. Um, this is the regional Thousand Palms flood control project. This is, um, we're going to be working on the right-of-way acquisition. This is very large, expensive project that we're going to have to save up for. Um, North Cathedral City Regional Stormwater Project, we've, um, we're looking to try to find some outside funding to help um, fund this project, but this project is also one of the ones that are on the $99 million list. Um, this is an ongoing, these are um, uh, East Side Dyke. So here's the Thousand Palms Channel Improvement Project. This is this is also one of the projects that's on our $99 million list. Um, 
This will be the last leg of the North Indio Regional Flood Control Project. So this will take, right now we're working on channeling the flows from the Sun City Palm Desert Del Webb development to Sun City Shadow Hills. From Sun City Shadow Hills, they still need to get into the Coachella Valley Stormwater Channel. So this will be that last leg to um, get those flows there. So that's, uh, that's an important project, which is why we've included it on the, um, on the $99 million list. And then we are uh, doing some additional um, rainfall gauge installations. Any questions on stormwater? Okay, west replenishment. This one is, is really easy. This is the Palm Desert Groundwater Replenishment Facility. Um, we're budgeting $2 million. We're hoping that we will be able to get through the permitting process. Um, Jerry, why, why only 19%? Oh, yeah, let me put that in perspective. So, <laughs> we did a budget amendment to reduce that to 377,000, mm -hmm. but we're not even gonna spend 377,000 um, because we just haven't been able to get anywhere on the permitting. So we haven't been able to in initiate any, any okay. construction funding. So um, we wanted to leave some money in there just in case something happens this year, but it doesn't look like it's gonna happen. So, okay. but that is, um, Supplemental water supply charge or using up that restricted fund so it doesn't have an impact on the rates. On the rates. Okay, good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. All right. So that's okay. So we're to our last fund. We're to sanitation. Any questions so far? <laughs> okay. 12 minutes and go. All right. We're going. Um, all right. So sanitation, um, lots of. There's been lots of activity in sanitation. So um, we completed warp, uh, monitoring wells at warp two. We're um, in the process by the end of the year, we'll have the four um, non-potable water connections that um, are located here along Hoboon Lane, um, a sewer pipe rehab project in Palm Desert and Thousand Palms. And then we'll have designs um, completed for these following projects. The, Warp 7 aeration improvements, Warp 7 phase 1 recycled water expansion, the Warp 10 T1 filter assessment and repair, Monroe, well, Monroe Street trunk sewer design, lift station 5511 capacity upgrade in Mecca, that design, and 11 additional non-potable water, non water connection projects. So the budget for next year in this fund is $35 million, and it's kind of broken up evenly between PAYGO, grants, loans, and even um, restricted funds. It's a pretty even pie chart there. Um, this, pro this fund has a lot of projects. Um, so, and there's two components to sanitation. There's the wastewater side, um, and then there's the recycled water side. So on the wastewater side, there's 23, or sorry, there's 18, 18 wastewater related projects that amounts to about $18 million. And then there's um, 23 recycled water projects that amounts to about $16 million. So total is 35. Um, this is for reference. Um, a lot of the projects are, are funded by multiple sources, pay as you go, loans, grants, um, and restricted. So this just break, shows the breakdown of, of the different percentages in case you ever want to refer to it. Um, for the grant and loan projects, there's about 15 million in funding. And that's for the uh, recycled water um, and there's a Monroe Street trunk sewer project in the East Valley. So these are all just detailed slides. Um, on these various projects. Um, these have all been brought to you at some phase to initiate the design. So hopefully they're not um, a surprise. Um, let's see. Um, the Warp 10, this is one of the proposed bond financing projects on the $99 million list as well as this T1 filter assessment that's also on the list. Um, 
These are some lift station projects. We're upsizing some pipelines as part of the Cochino development. Um, and the significance of this is that it's going to allow us to abandon two lift stations. Gary, I know uh, you've done very well, but Rick's got a couple slides he wants to go through um, as soon as you're done. I'm done. Thank you. Here's my summary. General comments, 10 seconds. Uh, the quarry project, uh, something that comes to mind is a different financial mechanism for that. I know that uh, we expect to receive some funding for canal water. Um, that's a general comment on that. And then a general comment I can follow up with you, Kerry, is uh, on the on-site investment for the uh, non -floatable. Um I just, I'm just wondering if any of those connections uh, take a blend of canal water or if it's all strictly recycled water. Uh, it's, it's a blend. Yeah, and so I was just wondering why those projects had a component of the backup facility or that other financing mechanism, whereas the quarry did it. So just, just a general comment. Okay. We could follow up offline. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are we racing through this because of me? I hope not. There's somebody else that needs to go at three. No, I mean, I'm... I'm it's Did I say I needed one, to be done by three? One for all and all for one. No, I know, and I had something, and I swear my phone's going to ring at three o'clock. I have no idea what it is. Well, don't answer it. So I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I don't race for me, but I could be wrong. I'll, I might change my tune in about four minutes. <laughs> well, I think we uh, nothing on my calendar, but I remember saying that I had something at three. I don't know what. I, I have a meeting at four, so I do need to get out of here at three thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But well, if we get to go through Rick's closer, and still then we have, have the have... operating budget, which I think is worthy. Can you of um, pull up Rick's presentation? It's item number three, please. Thank you. I think it's worthy of spending a little bit of time. This is the one that really makes it's difficult because of the rate increases. There it goes, Director Bianco. Um, I, I know Director Bianco is very interested in this stuff, so. I hate to go on without him. As long as we, we can give him five minutes, or yeah, I don't know whether he had his phone or not. Can I just make one comment while we're yeah. waiting for sure, the director? Absolutely. So, Please. Um, one of the messages I heard today, or one of the comments that stuck out to me, was that we're um, we have some open positions that we're trying to fill. And Carrie, I mean, I'd be just being engineering, but other departments as well. So, I'm wondering, is, is there something that we can do? I see Scott that we can do to help accelerate getting some of those positions filled. Are the classification salaries appropriate? Is there a reason to look at adjusting those salaries? I'm just curious as to if there's anything we as a board can do to help support you guys. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, uh, Director Aguilar. As it relates to uh, some of the CIP projects and the engineers, the engineering classification is an extremely difficult position to fill once it becomes vacant. Um, in the Coachella Valley, it's hard to recruit. One of the things that we're looking at uh, for next year is creating a cooperative with some of our universities so that we can have some engineers actually do a cooperative program with us. But as far as the, the recruitment process for the engineers right now, it, that's probably the most difficult position to fill. I belong with a consortium of HR directors in the Indio, Coachella, et cetera, and everyone within the engineering field, it, it's just very, very difficult to recruit. We are utilizing uh, two recruitment firms, Koff and Associates is one of those recruitment firms, as well as Alliance. And even with utilizing those firms, uh, as you can imagine, it's just, it's just hard to recruit the engineering classification. Um, I don't think it has anything to do with salary. I do think Coachella Valley in its own region is difficult to bring people in uh, to this area. Uh, you know, we try to recruit from the LA LA region, we try to recruit outside of LA and to San Diego, but again, it's just a difficult classification to recruit. Um, so we are looking at some, some alternatives, which would be the cooperative program so that we can hopefully work with some universities that have civil engineering programs to where we can bring some of those students to do a cooperative with us, which sure. means basically they're here for a semester, then they go to school for a semester and here for a semester. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, recruit some qualified individuals from that. that. That would be great. I'm glad to hear that. It clearly has a direct impact on outcomes and 
productivity. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. You get it. Thanks, Scott. All right. Well, I'm feeling the pressure now. So uh, um, th this item, uh, really, the, the the number one goal on my part was as to give you as soon as was humanly possible, because we, we have literally got the numbers hot off the press and the budget from the departments and through GM review, um, what rates are looking like, at least as far as our, our recommendations. And the, the uh, goal was that you have this in mind up front as we get into the detailed budget discussions over the next couple months um, versus the other, which is what I'm trying not to do, is we have all of our budget discussions over the next couple months, and then I say what the rate increase is, and then you say, well, if you would have told me up front, then this would have been a different step. And so that's, that's the goal here. Um, it's both intended to be high level and to solicit questions, feedback, areas of concerns, but as we develop the presentations, I've got that in mind and we can address your concerns more specifically. So that being said. Thank you for not starting at 50%. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I actually mean that because I think we've been there before. Okay. Anytime. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So uh, getting straight into the, 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 the numbers, there, there's really two things here. One, to give you some sense of what the overall budget is looking like. Uh, we will get into much more detail in subsequent study sessions, namely next month. Uh, and so uh, this, this was to give you the snapshot that on an adjusted basis, uh, next year's budget from an expense point of view is looking at just over 2% increase for a total of $304 million. Um, and I say adjusted basis because here's the important caveat when, when comparing this current year budget versus the one that we're talking about is in the current year we have 10 and a half million approved in the amended budget from drought penalties to pay for turf replacement. So uh, you don't have that expense next year so it's gonna look like a drop when it's a special funded program and so adjusted is just making it apples to apples if you remove that program. Um, the other sorts of key updates uh, on this is just headline numbers. Um, salaries and benefits came in um, pretty manageable at about 2.9% on a gross basis meaning just all of salaries and benefits before we look at taking out capitalized labor. Um, obviously, we're including everything that the board has already approved as part of the MOU negotiations, um, assuming things like a 5% quota for next year, given where inflation is now, that seems pretty reasonable. Um, it's less than that, uh, namely because we have retirements and our new staff don't come in at the top of the range, they come into the bottom of the range usually. Uh, and so you have natural savings and. Um, as, as we have staff turnover there. Um, different issues on experience and other sorts of operational things, but from this point of view, this is where that's reflected. Uh, on, as I mentioned, on supplies and services, that's the number that includes the turf rebates. So it looks the most wonky, to use my most scientific term. Uh, and so if you remove the turf re, uh, rebates from the numbers and just looked at it on sort of normal apples to apples, it's a 2.4% increase, not a 12% decrease. And so. Uh, that alone is a pretty good number considering how much we've talked about inflationary impacts on chemicals and valves and, and these kinds of things. Uh, these, uh, that reflects mostly the departments trying to manage expenses. And so um, the other one that is going to look off is utilities. You notice a very slight increase of about 0.6%. Um, this is namely due to our intended uh, temporary curtailment at the Levy facility. It actually takes a good amount of water, uh, power to run the operations there and get the water there. It's roughly about 1.4 million in, uh, in expense that's not showing up in next year budget that would normally be there. When you add that back in, it would, be, it would be close to a 7% increase in utilities, which is yeah. probably much more along the lines of expectations. Um, other thing that we'll look off just really quickly uh, is uh, in prior years, you will see what's called a pass-through or contra expense. We do a lot of things where we share expenses or do program and we get reimbursed and so we've we've shown that under this line the reimbursement side of the equation when you actually look at our financials though it's under the revenues because that's how we have to account for it and so in future years they'll just see it as an offsetting revenue rather than trying to to take it out of expenses because when you look at actuals it is in the expenses and so it's just easier to follow it that way but no real actual change in the, the level of activity so again, all of that to say a 2.2% year over year increase. And so it allows us to try and be much more manageable from a rate perspective, but that is district wide. Each 
uh, fund has its own story and its own pressures, and we'll get into that in the rest of the presentation. So on uh, the, the other side of this, just at a very high level, what you're going to see in, in the following slides is not a, a one-year sort of, here's the increase in expenses, here's the rates of what we need, uh, need to have. It's really looking over to five-year to say, where are our total reserves, where are, where's our debt going, where do we have to be as a minimum for debt coverage, uh, what's the best strategy for just preserving ratings, not even increasing reserves or these kinds of things, um, and, uh, and trying to eliminate structural deficits so that we don't have an ongoing problem. Um, uh, and so keeping all of these in mind and then staying within existing 218 rates that go out to FY26 um, is what you get in the following slides. So it's really a multi-year management strategy. Um, and uh, and the, uh, the other point I wanna make is at least for domestic, when we talk about these percent increases, that's, those are intended to be across the board increases. So not tier one's not going up 1% and tier two 10% and these kinds of things. It's everything is 5%. So that's, that would be total bill impact as well. That can be confusing when we do cost of service studies because each individual rate changes, sometimes at different percentages. Uh, when we actually talk about this in detail presentations going forward, the rate approval is only for the first year even though we're providing the forecast for the other years, those will be adjusted as actual events happen. Um, but we are trying to look at longer term management um, to try and smooth things out. Otherwise, you'd have radically different rate increases for each year, and that's not helpful to customers, uh, especially as we're communicating with them. So getting straight into the, the slides. Um, it's a busy slide, uh, I'll, I'll admit that up front. So I'll just describe the first one so you can follow it with me, and then the rest of them follow the same template. Um, the, uh, the green line is intended to show where our revenues are projected to be, and that's including the rate increases. So that's after them, not before them. Um, the, uh, uh, that's intended to cover what's the shading in the background, the red are operating expenses, and the yellow is net non-operating activity. So that would be uh, debt service and CIP. And so yellow is representing, you know, our, essentially our CIP program and what debt service we have, Red is the operating, and, and if it's under the green line, then we have excess revenues, and if it's over the green line, then we have a problem uh, for, for in any given year, and so that means it's coming out of reserves. You know, that really is a, uh, it's a new look, right? Mm -hmm. Interesting perspective to see how skinny that yellow line is. So, so this is, and it only shows up this way in domestic, I say net non-operating expenses. So we do have income on the non-operating side that offsets the CIP. It's pretty significant for domestic because it's the interfund loan payment mm -hmm. coming in that's almost almost $4 million. So that yellow so line- So that reduces bigger. the size of the yellow line. It does. Oh, I see, yeah. all right. Um, but yeah, that really is skinny. temporary, that's only for 15 years. And so when that runs out, there's gonna be a natural $4 million hole uh, that we'll have to adjust for, but that's not in this five year period. So the, the bars show where our cash balances are and are projected to be. Um, just as way of example, you'll notice they're about halfway down the line of the, the, the red area, which means we have about half a year's worth of cash on hand. Uh, the credit rating agencies would tell you you need to have a year and a half on hand, so that would be triple the size if we were trying to, to manage against credit ratings and the, the AA sort of scale. So um, all that being said, the goal here is preserve reserves, keep them stable, don't uh, have them decline, um, because that would threaten our credit rating even more, um, and, uh, and just be able to afford the structural sort of revenue requirement. Uh, domestic is seeing an overall increase, one, because of inflation, two, we have new debt service planned in this, we already talked about that, and that kicks in in FY27, um, and then we have to manage against uh, debt service coverage ratio. So if you look at the bottom, right-hand corner, th this much I wanted to show. Um, when you remove the interfund loan payment, which count is included currently in the interfund loan, uh, um, in the debt service coverage, uh, the coverage doesn't look as healthy as it did before. Um, so for instance, next year we might report to the credit rating agencies, we have 6.79 times coverage, but it's really two. Um, and that drops even more when the new debt service kicks in, when you remove the one-time funding from <laughs> The repayment. So, and they recognize that too. It's it's a temporary okay. uh, funding source. Qu so. Question on your starting point for the reserves. Are you 
how current is that number? Are you, do you, are you working off of an updated number for the current fiscal year? It's, it's fairly updated. So we take the official last year's number and then we have a projection for where we're gonna end this year with operating activity and sort of it adds, adds to it. And that's data through almost last month. So it's, it's pretty current. So it's pretty up to date. It's not the budget. It's, right. it's adjusted through the last month. Yeah, through actual operating okay. activity. All right. So are you saying that if, if without the interfund loan repayment that we would, would that mean that we'd be considered in default because we'd be low the one the one point two five or one point one zero is that a possibility? So t technically no, because in the technical definition, you can count the interfund loan, but from a credit rating perspective, they don't care about technical definitions. Mm -hmm. They're going to say your credit is weak, you have less income coming in than paying your obligations, um, and you have a structural problem, and so we we would have a lot of credit rating pressure downward pressure. And so if we did a debt issuance a few years from now, if we don't manage this, um, then it's going to be very expensive to issue debt. The, the interest rate will be much higher than Thanks. the 4% that I quoted. I did hear you say that double A minus was the perfect sweet spot. Yes, <laughs> it is. These numbers don't represent double A minus though. So, so that's the disclosure. Um, I'd be happy if we got A in the long term with these kinds of numbers. Um, but the alternative is much higher rate increases, and that's, that's just hard to justify. I think we can take care of this in the long term, as long as we have. Um, in, in full transparency, the number one thing that they're going to look at and is your willingness to do regular rate increases to, to keep pace. And so that's probably the hardest question to answer when we talk to them directly, is, well, why didn't you raise rates last year? You had cost increases. And if they don't see that willingness, then, then that's... That's the hard part. So if we are making progress towards a goal, towards a problem, it goes a long way with explaining things with them. And, and you know why we didn't raise rates, right? Because of that, it's the, the unassigned reserves, you know. Right. I mean, that in a nutshell, that's why. So, so the, if we manage to this plan, um, and again, this is over the five years. So this includes the debt and, and uh, I promise the other slides will be quicker. Uh, this, there's a lot of front to try and explain this. Uh, the advantage of issuing debt is there, there's not this year-to-year -year CIP management issue. Um, for instance, if we do the 99 million in issuance and um, the engineering group is one year delayed on the projects, it's still 99 million unless inflation mm -hmm. kicks up the project costs um, and the rate impact is the same because the debt service is still what it was before. So it doesn't have the same rate year-to-year -year rate increases um, that that uh, you tend to have on PAYGO um, uh, on that line. So it's easier to manage against. So it would be 5.5% increases uh, per year for, for the, the whole five years. And a lot of that is because of the new debt service um, coming in in the, the latter years and the inflation that we're trying to catch up against uh, up front. Uh, Canal is a little bit of a special story. It, it looks um, healthy up front, uh, but it can be deceiving. And so by that, I mean, uh, you see that the green bar is over expenses, but that green bar takes into account special one-time, pretty substantial revenues from the Bureau for curtailing replenishment. We're, we're anticipating accounting for that in the Canal Fund. Um, in total, I think that's over $40 million over the three years. And so those revenues reflect that. Um, obviously, expenses aren't affected by that in this particular case. And so it allows you to build up a little bit of a, of a one-time reserve. The trouble is Canal has long-term, very major CIP expenses that we're funding with debt. The $60 million program has to be repaid, um, and, we're, uh, uh, and so that kicks in um, over time, and then we have to have revenues that cover that. So up front, we're staying largely within Prop 218. You don't really need the larger rate increases up front um, because the debt service doesn't start kicking in until later down the plan. And so that's why once we get to uh, FY27-28, um, the percentage increase is uh, in the 10% range, and that's just to get um, essentially to a break-even point. Um, we might need to do 10% beyond FY28. It's, it's going to be interesting to see where expenses actually land, but this is largely driven by uh, debt, debt service repayment. Is the $60 million a 30-year or a 20-year? 
It's 30 years. 30 years. Okay. USDA is for this. The sanitation fund is probably the most challenged uh, of the funds that we're going to have to manage against long term domestic goods challenge as well, but sanitation is right, right there with it. Um, and that's largely because, as Carrie was just mentioning, we have CIP needs and we have debt already on the books and growing on the books as we do these projects. Um, and that's at the very lowest interest rate debt possible. These are all, all programs. Um, and uh, that's already taking into account restricted funds like capacity fees paying for a large part of these projects. And so uh, sanitation is definitely subject to inflationary pressures. Um, and then we have the, the new debt service. And so um, the keys here are preserving reserves. You notice that those are also about half um, or they're, they're a little less than one year worth of uh, operating expenses. Um, but uh, the other key here, and this is part of the plan, so if this isn't something the board wants to do, this is a good thing to talk about up front. Um, to stay in these rate increases, we had to move uh, 3.4 million in general property tax from the East Rack here, um, and uh, that's because we think that there's um, some ability to do, so, uh, to do that, and I'll talk about it on the East Rack side. If we don't want to move it here, then these rate increases would have to be larger. Um, and so uh, that's, that's a policy decision, um, but this is including that. And so the, the, essentially the rates here are limited by the 218 limit, um, and that gets us to a point where we are uh, able to pay for expenses and we're preserving the current level of reserves. We're not building those up. Uh, West Rack is a little bit more straightforward, but it's based on some uh, key assumptions. Probably the most primary key assumption, and, and uh, the highlight here is we think we can get away with two years at no rate increases, um, is that we are not taking or able to take any Rosedale Rio Bravo water. If we end up taking that, that can be very expensive, well over $6 million a year, um, and so that dramatically changes this picture. Um, but the current expectation is that that won't be available, so we're not assuming it in the, in the Is process. that true now? I mean, given the new hydrology over the last week or two? Um, it, we're depending on a Rosedale Rio Bravo to identify a new source of water that they can move out of the area um, to satisfy the water agreement that we have. Apparently, um, under their former general manager, they purchased water with the expectation of being able to sell it to us. And there was a reevaluation um, by Kern that that water could not leave the basin or the area. And so now they're, they're kind of stuck. They've, they've already kind of sent more than they could. So they've got to find a way to pay that back before they can actually start selling us more water. Okay. Yeah, I'm not up to speed on that. Okay, well, good financial impacts. Yes, so that, that makes it much rate. more manageable and it allows us to do the, the uh, loan repayment, the interfund loan repayment to domestic without raising rates. So that was going back to that, that comment. Um, and uh, there's no external debt on here, so we don't need to manage against debt service or other covenants. Um, on East Whitewater replenishment, there's a few different things going on. Um, one, as you will see, and, and I just mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, um, a temporary decrease in operating expenses, that's the red, um, and uh, that's uh, primarily because of the power requirements. That's the 1.4 uh, million uh, that isn't necessary while we're curtailing uh, replenishment, and so that comes right back as soon as we start replenishing again. So you'll see that's where the, the major increase in the red part of the, the, the graph uh, comes into play. Um, and this also assumes, as I mentioned, moving 3.4 million in property tax um, allocated revenues from this fund to sanitation because sanitation is facing much higher uh, rate pressures. And so uh, the key thing that we're managing against here is really against minimum debt service coverage. You'll notice even with the increases that I've mentioned, um, when we get towards the, end, the latter part here, once we have debt service and operating expenses kick up, we're right at the legal minimum. And so. Um, that's what we're going to have to, to, to watch against. Obviously, the increases that we're talking about are later in the period. So once we have more data, we'll get more specific on that. But this is generally what it would take to get to the legal minimum um, by the end of the period. The legal minimum. So, so this, this fund has external bonds, um, and we have to be at the 1.25 coverage 
when we set rates. So when we get to the, the last year, um, we're projecting even with these rate increases that we're there at 1.25 in essence. The highlighted portion says 1.33, it's, it's right there. I mean, there's almost no margin for error in the, in the projection. Your, your assumption uh, in, with the movement of the 3.4, is that 3.4 currently assigned to repayment of the bond or? Um, no, in, in, uh, this would be on top of uh, the amount necessary to repay the bonds. And so I think we had used some of this allocation before to repay other interfund debt that this fund had, but that's paid off, I think as of this year, so that, that debt payment doesn't continue. So there's an excess, is to, to put it shortly. There's still enough left over in property tax to pay for the existing debt um, and uh, some other things which are more appropriate to pay for property taxes than the, the rack fees. But, the, but just confirming that the, the property tax, you are keeping property tax in here for payment yes, of the, this of would the bond. Be a, above what we think we need. Okay. With the sanitation, go back to that real fast. So you're projecting 6.82, which is good, right? And 324 right. days. Yeah. Yes. So why why do we need such a rate increase? Don't, do, do, we don't need to be at those numbers. So on this one, it's it's purely if you follow the green the green line versus where the both the operating expenses and the debt service are, is if we do anything less than this, we'll be in a structural deficit, meaning we're not collecting enough to even pay ongoing debt service and operating expenses. So although, and and the reason why the numbers are so much higher, like 6.82 on debt service coverage, is because there's a lot of CIP replacement activity that doesn't get counted in the number. So it looks inflated, but anything less than this, and you're not able to pay ongoing expenses. So those reserves will just deplete to zero um, unless we do this. It seems, I mean, I, you know, I don't have a personal problem with structural deficit as long as we're in a position to do something about it. And I don't know. It, it seems like you're meeting your debt service coverage ratio with a lower rate increase, right? Curious what that number is. Or, or with less money coming over from the East rack, one or the other or both. Right, well, well uh, to put it a different way, the, the debt service coverage isn't the issue, the issue on this fund. Right. It's purely just money coming in versus expenses. No, I understand, right. but, but that's just, Maybe we don't have a stomach for that, but but maybe we do, because we know it's temporary, or you know, depending on how we right. set it up, right? Right. Well, that that's the concern with this one is all of the activity here is not is ongoing. So if if we don't keep at this pace, eventually you're going to have to catch up, and that will be a huge rate increase because all you're going to do is draw down on reserves. If this was one time, we could use reserves to to weather one time changes. But that's yeah. what I mean by structural deficit. No, I get it. Problem. I get it. You still have this buffer of the unassigned reserves, which are currently $25 million, right? Right. So if we spend down the reserves, we're now reducing the day's cash on hand. But we've also got the yellow line above the ground. No, I understand. Line. Yeah. Just seems like it's maybe overdone a little bit. The, uh, yeah, that's that's the, the challenge here. It's it, this is mostly driven by by debt service and paying uh, paying for ongoing debt service. So I. So if you were to show twenty twenty nine, which the number would be down. Well, yeah. So what's your what's your covenant for days cash on hand? Uh, the rating agencies would tell you you need about 500 to be in the, the double A range. Wow. So we're, we're but the I'm talking about co I'm talking about covenants. So you don't there there isn't a covenant on on there the isn't only right. on your net income. Right. Right. Okay. Well. I mean, from the first presentation, I think there was an opening slide that showed um, how the rating agencies looked at that stuff. And it was, uh, you had the, 
uh, was slide eight, where he basically had the target was two times debt coverage for right. liquidity in order to get the AA minus ratings. I get it. So, so how would that affect us? Are, are we planning to issue new debt in uh, this fund? Yeah. It would be this bonds. part of the 99 million. There, so so those are bonds that were which need a rating not, not loans right right and those the paying for those bonds would kick in in fy27 that's why you see that that continued growth the good news this is the little bit of a danger showing it as a five-year is uh once we build in the rate increase to pay for the new debt that's not a year-by-year -year increase that debt service is flat and so after this it would just be inflationary normal increases and so there might be some room on the latter two years um, if, if we look at that a little bit more and uh, uh, maybe phase it in over a few more years. But these, these upfront years, which are just paying for existing debt, um, we'll, we'll have much larger issues if we don't have some rate increases along these magnitude. Um, otherwise, that deficit starts kicking in. What's our, what's our uh, monthly, this is a, what, what is our sanitation rate for domestic? What is, what is a house? A monthly because residential comes in on the property tax. On the property tax. So, so what's a, I guess, year, yearly, whatever. What, what is it cost? Um, the monthly equivalent would be for a typical residential to about 2650 26 bucks. So yeah. a couple dollars, two or three dollars a month increase. Right. Yeah. I, it, but it's paid on the property. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. It averages about $2.50 extra per month per year of these increases. So overall about $10 yeah. well, for four years, yeah. This, you did a good job. This, looks, this is good. Um, I, I would ask though, and I'm sure probably on the next ones, you'll actually plug in the dollar amounts. Yes, that, when okay. we get through the details, you'll okay. have all the references. <laughs> okay. But I didn't, I didn't want to overwhelm up front. Yeah, because it's hard for me to get well, the dollar amounts. Yeah, and we're pretty, we're pretty, Facile with the domestic rate and the canal rate, but this one I, I can't remember because you don't really see the bill. You know, yeah. On the um, if you could go back, uh, so so all the all the recycled water projects are embedded in this fund also. Yes. Okay. Yeah, anything not paid for by grants. Okay, and then. Uh, which, which grants do cover a, a lot of them, so. Okay, and and about how much, how much of that is embedded in here on that what's not covered by grants by loans, how much would you say on, on just ballpark? And it's a five year right five year kind of projection. I'm just trying to get a sense if it's, hundred million, uh, fifty million. And we'll, we'll get the number. I don't Thank think you. it's yeah. To that yeah. magnitude, um, mo it's mostly grant. And, and the more. and the reason that it kind of comes to mind is from the other question that I had about where we have on-site expenses, seventeen percent uh, from from those uh, other fund funding sources. Uh, it just seemed like it was a long list. So, and so for loans kind of... over the next five years, we're projecting um, about fifty-two million in sanitation. Grants about thirty three million. But, but that's not all re that's not all recycled. Um I, I don't have it. Broken. Probably not, right? We can, we can, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just wondering. Right, right. Just trying to figure out how much we're baking in there. Thank you. Sanitation for twelve bucks. So on on so, East no, Rock no, just no, to close expense. out that one. Um so the, the challenge is we have temporary savings that come, those costs come back. Um, and uh, uh, when they come back, we, we have to, the challenge of meeting debt coverage as a legal minimum. And so that's, that's what we're having to deal with. We'll get more specific. As it, the challenges are towards the end of the five-year period. So as we know more, we'll, that, those, those forecasts will get updated. Is, is the only difference there then on the, on the operating expenses just the purchase of water? Uh, or is there something else there? So the the cost for the water um, obviously goes down as we're not buying canal water. Mm -hmm. the cost for the power goes down, as we mentioned, and there's some labor reallocation as the maintenance needs for the facility are are different, and so those are all accounted 
for its temporary savings, and they all come back um, uh, over time. Okay. Yeah. Mission Creek is the easiest to describe. We don't think we need a rate increase here, um, and there's no debt associated with this. Um, stormwater, uh, to go back to a subject of much discussion today, the primary challenge here is, as we've been talking about, the revenues are fixed um, unless we do the, the uh, voter initiative to uh, increase, increase uh, the tax amount. We have to live within existing taxes. The only other part I would comment on is uh, we do have a material source of revenue in investment income because of the reserves. Uh, functionally, it acts like an endowment to provide ongoing revenues to the degree, and this is just the warning, that we drain those down. You're cutting off ongoing revenues to pay for projects going forward. The hope would be if we stabilize those, then you can keep those, those revenues in perpetuity. And so um, this fund isn't really high in operating expenses. It's all high in CIP. Um, obviously, we've been dealing that, with that with these very, very large projects. And so um, my last comment here is um, obviously we're not dealing with rates. It's living within the existing projected revenues. But we're pretty much tapped out at the end of this on, I think, new debt. We're going to have to pay down our existing debt, which we do. Um, um, but when, we're going to have to wait until we pay down a little bit before we feel comfortable issuing more debt than we've already talked about in the five-year plan. And then uh, just to, to round it out, we'll bring more detail. I think the official date is the April 18th for the study session uh, in April. May, uh, the intent is to have our study session focused on the State Water Project Fund and the proposed tax necessary to fund that. We'll have all the latest and greatest data um, in May, and so it kind of doesn't help to give it to you now, and then because of hydrologic conditions, everything's changing. Um, so we'll bring that in May when we, we uh, think we have the best data. And then between now and then, using board meetings to help um, uh, address questions to follow up items so we stay up to date on your concerns. And then June would be adoption. So Jim, I have a question, or anybody really. So are we no longer, have we, are we current then on our cost of service studies? Is that not? Uh, we've got, necessary? we've got one more in the oven uh, that we're kind of still looking at. Um, it, the board has not been briefed. Staff is still doing some work on it. Um, it was primarily to try and relook at the narrative. Um, but we have it. subsequently found that there is there are also some rate drivers that will will provide some incremental uh, increases to okay. some of them. So, but just relative to the future board discussions, we have a framework. So, right. So for the for the budget going forward or the rates going forward, we're still covered by the last uh, 218 that we did. And it's the 218 that provides that uh, limit, not the cost of service. The cost of service provides the defense or the narrative for where you want to set the 218 rates. Um, we are required to do a 28. We're required to do a cost of service once every 10 years because we provide service to another public agency. Anytime you change rates, you have to do a 218, whether or not you back it up with a cost of service or or some other analysis. It's always good to have something to explain why the rates are changing under a 218. But we typically do it five years because that's a long enough horizon. Things change uh, even within those five years. But we don't have to do it. We could do a 10-year. Is that what you said? Uh, we could uh, do a 10-year cost of service, but we try and look at rates on an annual basis. And then uh, in order to do a 218, um, in order to change the rates at all, we have to do a 218. So it's kind of a chicken or an egg thing uh, when it comes down to it. There, there is uh, a, a danger the longer you go out in your 218 because you have to show the cu cumulative maximum potential rate increase and so your customer will see yeah. the end number after 10 years and, and that does tend to raise concerns. Yeah. yeah, which is a number that may never come to pass. It may never right. pass. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so if there's any final questions. Very good. Very good job, Rick. Yeah, Thank good. You. Very good job. you don't seem like the new guy. It is pretty, pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. Yeah, good. All right, well, uh, those are our three items of study. We will go into greater detail on them as the budget season continues. And uh, having no further business. And very good job, Carrie, too. Yeah, Carrie. And Stuart and Scott. Name. Out, but you guys have done great. Good, good you guys day. have been through it before. Rick had not. Yeah. No, he's going to get.
you know, we'll let you know. And yeah. That was a good one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the other guy quit. <laughs> I think technically you retired. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we are adjourned. <laughs>